For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track. But the jam spread backward around the track like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real life jams move backward at about the same speed. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track. But the jam spread backward around the track like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real life jams move backward at about the same speed. Well, in 2004, we integrated ticketing in South East Queensland. So we introduced a paper uh, ticket that allowed you to travel across all the three modes in South East Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of uh, integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card. And the smart card will enable people to store value, uh, so to, to put uh, value on the card and then to use the card for travelling around the system. Well, in 2004, we integrated ticketing in South East Queensland, so we introduced a paper uh, ticket that allowed you to travel across all the three modes in South East Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of uh, integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card. And the smart card will enable people to store value, uh, so to, to put uh, value on the card and then to use the card for travelling around the system. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go? when pursuing a partner. I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go? when pursuing a partner. I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit.
Abandoned pueblos are scattered throughout the southwestern U.S., and at many, archaeologists have uncovered a curious artifact, the skeletons of scarlet macaws. The bird's bright red feathers are known to have been an important status symbol, a signifier of prestige, for people throughout the American tropics and the southwest, both in the ancient world and today. But macaws are a tropical bird, whose range never extended north of today's U.S.-Mexico border. So how did the Pueblo people obtain the birds? To examine the bird's origin, scientists sequenced mitochondrial DNA found within macaw bones from two sites in New Mexico, Chaco Canyon and the Mimbres region. Turns out nearly three-quarters of the birds had identical mitochondrial genome sequences, meaning the ancient birds came from the same maternal line. That suggests they were all the products of a breeding operation, perhaps in modern-day northern Mexico, rather than a random collection of wild-caught birds. Abandoned pueblos are scattered throughout the southwestern U.S., and at many, archaeologists have uncovered a curious artifact, the skeletons of scarlet macaws. The bird's bright red feathers are known to have been an important status symbol, a signifier of prestige, for people throughout the American tropics and the southwest, both in the ancient world and today. But macaws are a tropical bird, whose range never extended north of today's U.S.-Mexico border. So how did the Pueblo people obtain the birds? To examine the bird's origin, scientists sequenced mitochondrial DNA found within macaw bones from two sites in New Mexico, Chaco Canyon and the Mimbres region. Turns out nearly three-quarters of the birds had identical mitochondrial genome sequences, meaning the ancient birds came from the same maternal line. That suggests they were all the products of a breeding operation, perhaps in modern-day northern Mexico, rather than a random collection of wild-caught birds. Crows, she says, are what's known as partial migrants. Every year, some members of the population migrate between breeding grounds and their overwintering grounds, like parking lots. But others just stay put. So Townsend and her colleagues wanted to know if that urge to migrate was something individual crows can turn on and off. To find out, they captured 18 crows from overwintering spots in California and New York. They fitted the birds with little backpack satellite tags and tracked them for several years. Overall, three-quarters of the birds migrated, an average of 300 miles. And more importantly, if they migrated once, they did it every year, suggesting traveling is not a habit they switch on and off. The researchers also found that migrating crows returned faithfully to the same breeding grounds every year, but they were more flexible on where to overwinter, which could be a good thing. Crows, she says, are what's known as partial migrants. Every year, some members of the population migrate between breeding grounds and their overwintering grounds, like parking lots. But others just stay put. So Townsend and her colleagues wanted to know if that urge to migrate was something individual crows can turn on and off. To find out, they captured 18 crows from overwintering spots in California and New York. They fitted the birds with little backpack satellite tags and tracked them for several years. Overall, three-quarters of the birds migrated, an average of 300 miles. And more importantly, if they migrated once, they did it every year, suggesting traveling is not a habit they switch on and off. The researchers also found that migrating crows returned faithfully to the same breeding grounds every year, but they were more flexible on where to overwinter, which could be a good thing. To figure out these counterintuitive findings, the researchers conducted an experiment in a hotel room. They rounded up some lizards, gave them a perch, and then used a leaf blower to mimic the effects of high winds. They set up a net to catch any lizards that lost their grip. As the artificial wind blew, the lizards moved so the perch took most of the airflow. But their hind legs would stick out. And if those rear limbs stuck out too far, they acted as sails. Eventually, those back legs were blown off the perch, and the lizards were just holding on with their front two legs. And they could only hold on like that for so long as the wind speeds increased further and further until eventually they were blown off the perch and into the nets. So shorter back legs gave a survival advantage. 
a trait that might be passed on to the next wizard generation. To figure out these counterintuitive findings, the researchers conducted an experiment in a hotel room. They rounded up some lizards, gave them a perch, and then used a leaf blower to mimic the effects of high winds. They set up a net to catch any lizards that lost their grip. As the artificial wind blew, the lizards moved so the perch took most of the airflow. But their hind legs would stick out. And if those rear limbs stuck out too far, they acted as sails. Eventually, those back legs were blown off the perch, and the lizards were just holding on with their front two legs. And they could only hold on like that for so long as the wind speeds increased further and further until eventually they were blown off the perch and into the nets. So shorter back legs gave a survival advantage, a trait that might be passed on to the next lizard generation. Last year, astronomers observed two neutron stars collide, a crash transmitted in gravitational waves to detectors here on Earth. Represented in sound, you can hear a small upward sweep in frequency in the data, if you listen closely. Several seconds later, the first waves of electromagnetic radiation arrived here on Earth, the first time a collision has been detected by both light and gravitational waves. And it's in studying the electromagnetic echoes of the collision that astrophysicists have gotten a far better glimpse of what really happened after those binary neutron stars merged 130 million light years away. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it gives us an understanding of uh, basically all the uh, nitty gritties of what is going on after the merger takes place. Kunal Mule, an astrophysicist at Caltech. First, he says, the stars collided, creating a massive black hole-like object, which started sucking up the cloud of neutron-rich cosmic debris left over from the crash. But its appetite was limited. It cannot eat all of it, so some bit of it basically escapes. Those escaping leftovers spewed outward into space as a powerful jet. But along the way, Mule says, the jet appears to have interacted with that cloud of neutron-rich material, blowing up a sort of cocoon within the debris floating around the collision. Until finally, the jet burst out and slammed into interstellar space, releasing yet more radiation we could detect here on Earth. Many different types of barcode scanning machines exist but they all work on the same fundamental principles. They all use the intensity of light reflected from a series of black and white stripes to tell a computer what code it is seeing. White stripes reflect light very well, while black stripes reflect hardly any light at all. The barcode scanner shines light sequentially across a barcode, simultaneously detecting and recording the pattern of reflected and non-reflected light. The scanner then translates this pattern into an electrical signal that the computer can understand. All scanners must include computer software to interpret the barcode once it's been entered. This simple principle has transformed the way we are able to manipulate data and the way in which many businesses handle record keeping. Many different types of barcode scanning machines exist, but they all work on the same fundamental principles. They all use the intensity of light reflected from a series of black and white stripes to tell a computer what code it is seeing. White stripes reflect light very well, while black stripes reflect hardly any light at all. The barcode scanner shines light sequentially across a barcode, simultaneously detecting and recording the pattern of reflected and non-reflected light. The scanner then translates this pattern into an electrical signal that the computer can understand. All scanners must include computer software to interpret the barcode once it's been entered. This simple principle has transformed the way we are able to manipulate data and the way in which many businesses handle record keeping. A majority of U.S. high school students say they get bored in class every day, and more than one out of five has considered dropping out, according to a survey released on Wednesday. The survey of 81,000 students in 26 states found two-thirds of high school students complain of boredom, usually because the subject matter was irrelevant 
or their teachers didn't seem to care about them. A majority of US high school students say they get bored in class every day, and more than one out of five has considered dropping out, according to a survey released on Wednesday. The survey of 81,000 students in 26 states found two thirds of high school students complain of boredom, usually because the subject matter was irrelevant or their teachers didn't seem to care about them. That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all, because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hire a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can and often does develop the strategy for the company, but ultimately it's always the CEO who has the final go-no-go -no -go decision on strategy. That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all, because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hire a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can and often does develop the strategy for the company, but ultimately it's always the CEO who has the final go-no-go -go decision on strategy. The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens, whose wisdom may be discerned the true interests of their country, and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves convened for the purpose. The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may be discerned the true interests of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves convened for the purpose. Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, classic Latin. So what's so new about it?
Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books. Useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world. Classic Latin. So what's so new about it? For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard. His works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard. His works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. The ocean has been getting bluer, according to a study published in the journal Nature. But that's not really good news for the planet. It means that the plants that give the ocean its green tint aren't doing well. Scientists say that because the ocean has been getting warmer. The ocean has been getting bluer, according to a study published in the journal Nature. But that's not really good news for the planet. It means that the plants that give the ocean its green tint aren't doing well. Scientists say that because the ocean has been getting warmer. Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed, even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Miri, something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament something we have to face up to as a nation? Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Miri, Something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament something we have to face up to as a nation? Lawrence Stephen Lowry, RBSRA, was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Penned Liberi, Lancashire, who lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial district of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes, people with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious, unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits, and the unpublished Naria networks, which were only found after his death.
Lawrence Stephen Lowry, RBSRA, was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Penn Liberi, Lancashire, who lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial district of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes, people with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious, unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits, and the unpublished Naria networks, which were only found after his death. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the Central Contract Patterns Generator, CPG. This process pr produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in ways that produce running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes, such as going from standstill to walking. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the Central Contract Patterns Generator, CPG. This process pr produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in ways that produce running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes, such as going from standstill to walking. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Luzier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Luzier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. Financial markets swung wildly yesterday in frenzied trading market by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. At the same time, trading in the European credit markets in London was exceptionally heavy as traders frantically reassessed their appetite for risk, prompting wild swings in the prices of key derivatives. It was the third day of frantic activity in the European credit markets suggesting that equity market swings were prompting a wider repositioning of investors in a host of asset classes. Financial markets swung wildly yesterday in frenzied trading market by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. At the same time, trading in the European credit markets in London was exceptionally heavy as traders frantically reassessed their appetite for risk, prompting wild swings in the prices of key derivatives. It was the third day of frantic activity in the European credit markets, suggesting that equity market swings were prompting a wider repositioning of investors in a host of asset classes.